This podcast does not provide medical nor legal advice. Please listen to the complete disclosure at the end of the recording. Hello and welcome to Everyone Dies, the podcast where we talk about serious illness, dying, death, and bereavement. I'm Marianne Matzo, a nurse practitioner, and I use my experience from working as a nurse for 46 years to help answer your questions about what happens at the end of life. And I'm Charlie Navarrete, an actor in New York City and here to offer an every person viewpoint to our podcast. We are both here because we believe that the more you know in advance, the better prepared you are to make difficult decisions before a crisis hits. So welcome to this week's show. Please relax, get yourself some cold milk and warm cookies, and thank you for spending the next hour with Charlie and me as we talk about the barriers to managing pain for people at the end of their life. With this week's show, we're starting a three-part series about pain management with a world-renowned pain management expert, Patrick Coyne. Like the BBC, we see our show as offering entertainment, enlightenment, and education and divided into three halves to address each of these goals. Our main topic is in the second half, so feel free to fast forward to that babble-free zone. In the first half, Charlie has a story about a new statue of Queen Elizabeth that has been unveiled and a recipe that you can take to your next funeral lunch. In the second and third halves, we have an interview with Patrick Coyne about the factors that interfere with managing pain at the end of life. In our first half, remember when I did a hard-hitting, in-depth report about Queen Elizabeth and her corgis? Yeah, me neither. But I'm told that I did, and it was brilliant. Well, Elizabeth II loved her corgis, and wherever she went, her short-legged dogs were sure to go. Now, the late queen's relationship with her dog has been immortalized in bronze. A seven-foot-tall statue of Elizabeth and her dogs, created by London-based sculptor Highwell Prattley, was unveiled in April on what would have been her 98th birthday. The new monument is located outside the library in Oakham, England a small town about 100 miles north of London. Various dignitaries attended the unveiling ceremony, but more interesting were the more than 40 corgis from the Welsh Corgi League that joined a parade to Oakham Castle. The piece was commissioned by Sarah Furness, the Lord Lieutenant of Rutland. Oakham is part of Rutland County. You know, Marianne, there's also Rutland County in New Jersey, too, and it's hard to tell them apart. Um, it caused approximately well, you know, 125. You know, since, since hmm? what you know, since you since you stopped, yeah. I was just thinking that I would like to be the Lord Lieutenant of. I don't know. Everyone dies. Hmm. I think that's a great title. Well, then, Lord if you would, if, if now, if you would be the lieutenant, then who would be? Uh, maybe Commander in Chief Commodore. Let us say Commodore. I, I met a Vice Commodore recently. She she did, she Ooh. sails she sails and she is the vice commodore of something sailing. That's, that's for another time. Some, um, so so, but uh, lieutenant, I mean you're a uh, uh, high woman on the totem pole. So uh, shouldn't your title be a little higher? I don't know. I I'm I'm happy with lord of anything. Okay. Lord I of- could just be the lord of anything. Lord Lieutenant. Lord of everything. So, so, Lord Lieutenant, so we could call you Double L for short. Well, I'd rather just be called Lord, thank you. Uh huh. I knew it. Lord <laughs> Lieutenant was not going to be enough for you. All right, we got it. Um, where were we? Oh, the cost. Yeah. 125,000 pounds, which is approximately $155,000 and was funded primarily by donations per BBC News' Samantha Noble. The Rutland County Council described the piece as the first permanent memorial to Britain's much-loved and longest-reigning monarch. The work depicts Elizabeth standing and wearing a state robe and a crown. A bronze corgi sits at her feet nestled against the folds of her gown. 
The statue of the queen rests atop a pedestal made of local and castor limestone, which features two additional bronze corgis, one with its front paws on the pedestal and the other standing on all fours. The sculpture includes a bench to sit on and a corgi to take selfies with. The artist said he wanted to capture a maternal feeling of the queen and include the corgis to reflect her humanity. And speaking of that maternal feeling, our recipe this week is a grandmother, and Her Highness was a grandmother, a grandmother-approved casserole that you can feed a family with or take to your next funeral lunch. Reunion pea casserole is made with black-eyed peas and has a sauces and cheese filling all covered with a refrigerated crescent roll crust. Good appetite, or as the French say, bon appetite. <laughs> Please go to our webpage for this week's recipe for reunion pea casserole and additional resources for this program. Everyone Dies is offered at no cost, but is not free to produce. Many of you contact Marianne because of her expertise and her ability to explain complicated issues in everyday terms. So please contribute what you can. Your tax-deductible gift will go directly to supporting our nonprofit journalism so that we can remain accessible to everyone. You can also donate at www.everyonedies.org. That's every, the number one, dies.org, or at our website on Patreon, www.patreon.com, and search for Everyone Dies. Marianne? Thank you, Charlie. Hello, and welcome to our second half of Everyone Dies. We have with us today Patrick Coyne, who is a consultant and assistant professor at the Medical College of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. Patrick, welcome to Everyone Dies. Well, thank you for inviting me. Happy to be here. I met Patrick, God, it must be at least 25 years ago, maybe even longer now, when we started working on the End of Life Nursing Education Consortium together. And uh, Patrick's gone all over the world. I've gone all over the country with LNEC. And we have the distinction of having been in... Colorado on 9-11, which was um, quite an adventure. Yes, it was. <laughs> Patrick ended up driving back from Colorado. But that's another story. So we're going to be talking about pain management, um, and we're going to do a series of three parts. To and, and this really all comes from a paper that Patrick and a few of his colleagues wrote about pain management nursing and a position statement, which is sort of like a call for action to uh, address some of the issues in pain management. And these are issues that have been addressed maybe in some way or another, but still have a need in terms of pain management for people who are facing the end of life. And just to quote from the beginning of his paper, um, they talk about pain management is essential from the time of diagnosis of a serious illness and throughout the disease trajectory. They go on to say that, unfortunately, the prevalence of inadequately controlled pain occurring in those with serious illness remains unacceptably high. In most cases, pain experienced by people with advanced disease can be prevented or relieved through optimal care. Yet studies reveal that patients continue to experience uncontrolled pain in the final weeks, days, and hours of their lives. So today, we're going to be talking about the barriers to pain management at the end of life. And his article goes on to say that the barriers to adequate pain relief include those associated with the patient and family, healthcare providers, and healthcare systems. And one of the recommendations was public education regarding these issues. And so I thought, what a perfect opportunity to invite Patrick to come on and, and talk about these issues. So, Patrick, when you talk about barriers to pain management at the end of life, what, what are you and your team talking about? Well, we, there are a lot of barriers, and they can be very specific to a region, to a culture, 
um, to a population. And so really all of those can come in there. But I think some of the barriers that we're seeing more commonly right now in the United States is uh, I would call it opiate phobia, where uh, patients or families are afraid of pain medications because they're afraid they're going to get addicted. And um, it, it, why that's, I don't want to downplay that here. Clearly, it's a concern. But when you're dealing with a life-threatening illness, it's, it's important um, for you to have comfort and not to suffer in pain because we know you'll live better, you'll live longer, you'll have better quality of life. And you won't suffer. And um, and really, the the fear of addiction it's real. Um, and a lot of people have had their lives changed because of opiates. But the other part of it is, with good pain management by a good provider, um, really uh, the chances of addiction are minimal compared to the suffering that can come with it. And um, I've been doing this for a long time, and. I, I would just hate to see a patient or a family watch their loved one suffering because they're afraid of addiction. Because clearly, it's hard to get addicted when you're in pain um, because the opiates just are really working to take away the suffering um, rather than give you the euphoria. And and honestly, I'd love to see people have that euphoria. I just never see it. And so, addiction or fear of addiction uh, from opiates is a, is a big issue. But we have a lot of other barriers patients and families go through. Um, the pain medications are expensive, um, and a lot of families can't afford them. And we also know that nationally they're not prescribed equally. Um, you know, a, a white Caucasian male will tend to get more pain medications than someone who's not. So women get less pain medications. Children don't get it sufficient amounts. The elderly don't. Uh, minorities clearly don't. And there's some really great studies demonstrating that pharmacies and poor zip codes um, don't even carry pain medications um, because of their fears of um, being robbed or addiction and such. So we, we do have a lot of barriers that um, are on their patients and loved ones side um, that they're, we're dealing with. So we do need a lot of education. Um, and I think a lot of people have been misled by the the downsides to opiates rather than how they can um, improve a quality of life. And opiates do more than really pain. They can help with breathing. Um, and it, we know that if someone's comfortable, they move more. And, you know, an end of life, there's some studies that will show that if patients get opiates, they probably live longer. So when you talk about the poor neighborhoods, um, is that the whole idea of geography as destiny when it comes to symptom management of the end of life? It can be part of it. I, I mean, for uh, people in rural communities, you know, their their pharmacy may not see enough prescriptions of pain medications, so they just don't carry them, and so the per people in rural communities could wait you know, days to weeks for the drugs to arrive. Um, whereas inner cities um, may be fearful that they're going to be robbed because they carry them. So they just stop carrying them. So the, the reasons can be very different based on your location. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's part of the challenges that we're seeing in the United States. So if so, if our listener, one of our listeners is listening, listening from a rural area, what sorts of suggestions would you give them if they're on an opioid and they're having trouble getting it? Well, I, I think the first thing I would do is if they're seeing a, a, a provider in an uh, in a inner city, which often happens with uh, diseases like cancer or heart failure, that they may want to try to get their prescriptions filled before they head home. Mm -hmm. um, or they can talk to their provider and say, look, my pharmacy won't have the medication you want me to have for a week. Is there something you can uh, prescribe and talk to a pharmacist that may be available right now? Um, and as people who, you know, as, as someone who is writing prescriptions and, and making suggestions, I think the big issue I'm finding is there's 
Um, another barrier we're <laughs> um, dealing with right now is there are opiate shortages. And so I'm constantly changing patients from one medication to another because, frankly, we can't find the drug that the patient was on. Wow. And why is that? I think a lot of it came down with uh, um, the, the DEA tightened the strings on producing opiates mm -hmm. and prescribing opiates. So the, it, their goal clearly was to decrease um, over prescribing of opiates and, and therefore decrease addiction. And it may have had a, an impact. I'm not sure it did, but it had one impact for those patients who need pain medications. It's made it much harder to find them. Now, I, when I was uh, working at the Cancer Center the Palliative Care Unit, um, I've been retired for a couple of years now, but patients would report that they'd gone to their pharmacy and the pharmacy explained to them that they get a certain number of opioids every month. And when those opioids run out, they don't get any until the next month. Is that still a situation that you find? I find that it, you know, it's, a, it's a situation that pharmacies put on themselves. No one else is doing it. Mm. So they say, we're only going to order 75 of this medication a month. Um, and if we run out, we run out. But it, if they wanted to, they could order 80. I see. Well, and I would always say to my patients, listen, get this script filled right across the street at the hospital because the hospital will have it because we never had any problem with the hospital having it. And, um, you know, it's sort of a planning thing for them. You know, you come in for your appointment, you get your script, you go across and you get it filled right away. Because if you take that home and you wait, you might not get it in a timely fashion, which is what you've been saying. Yeah, in, in rural areas, that would be true. But I'm I'm in a large academic area, and we're still running into drug shortages. Really? Wow. Yes, it, it's it's very common. Um, it, it, it more often than not, it's IV pain medications, but not always. I see. Um, so the fear of addiction is uh, is a, is a a real concern that I've heard from patients also. And um, that fear can you know, lead to shame or guilt over the use of opioids. Can you walk us through the conversation that you would have with patients if they've raised that fear? Sure. Um, I, I'm usually starting with an open-ended question. So what is it you're afraid of? And, um, and, and you'll get a lot of different answers. Uh, my, when my father got sick, they gave him morphine, and he was dead in a day. I, I don't want that. Um, I, I do a lot of um, volunteer work overseas, and in some cultures, taking pain medication would be a sign of weakness mm -hmm. in their culture. And so, um, you know, that would be another reason. Um, I've had patients say, I, I need to deal with this. It's a punishment from my God. Mm -hmm. And so all of these open-ended questions you could see would take you down a different road. But the next one, the other answer may be, I'm very afraid I'm going to become addicted because my brother was an addict or I have friends who have become addicted to pain medication. And so, you know, then my conversation would go down the road. Um, you know, I'm my job is to ensure that you're comfortable, but to also to keep you um in no danger of getting addicted. So I'm going to be watching how you use the medications. Um, if you follow the prescriptions, if you run out early, um, you know, in, in our outpatient clinic, we actually do drug screening and um, we're doing it for two reasons. One, I want to make sure you're taking the medications and you have a level. And, but if you don't have the level, then what are you doing with the pain medications? And I'm, you know, about 5% of the population that we follow, um, we usually have inherited, have a problem um, with misusing their medications or um, misappropriating other medications uh, because they may like, uh, let's say, take a, a pain medication and they'd rather cope, they sell it for crack cocaine or something. Um, so if we don't see the opiates there, that sure raises a flag for us. 
But uh, really, my job is to keep the patient safe. So we're making sure they're using them appropriately. We're working so that they don't get addicted. And there are populations of patients who have a prior history of addiction, and they fought really hard to get clean. And they don't want to go down that road again. So I'll bring in their sponsors from Narcotics Anonymous, and we'll all have a conversation. And I'm clearly going to try to manage pain without using opiates, if possible, with every patient. Um, but there, there are, is a population of patients when disease gets worse where opiates are actually the safest and the most effective medications. So what do you do when patients come in or call and they say, my, my medicine has been stolen? Um, I, I, realistically, the first thing I said is, well, why don't you come in to see us and I'd like to see the police report. Mm-hmm. And do people uh, usually a, bring you a police report? No. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it, <laughs> I was going to say, I've it, never seen a police report when I've asked for one, so I was wondering if you've ever yeah. seen one. Yeah, we, we're we pretty much at, adamant nowadays that they have to do it. And you know, I'm not in the outpatient setting all that often uh, anymore, um, mostly because I'm doing inpatient, but when I am out in the outpatient setting, I that would be how I'm teaching my fellows and the residents is that the expectation is that you're, I'm going to need a police report. And if you haven't filed it, you need to file one. And so what do people do for pain until, like, how do how, what's the next thing that happens after that? Uh, you know, it's very individualized. Um, you know, the, it, it, I don't think there's, what we would normally do is they'd cut, we'd give them medicines for two to three days. We'd be doing another drug screen. Sorry. And we would likely we would likely um, ha- put them on a tighter tighter group. So instead of getting a month supply of pain medications, they may have to come in weekly mm-hmm. until we can rebuild trust. And do you get resistance from patients for that? Oh, uh, yeah, but we we pretty much have a, I think nationally everyone has a, a two or three strikes and you're out. And and before we start prescribing, we're very clear of what their expectations of us should be, but also mm-hmm. what our expectations of them should be. And, you know, I'll talk about having lock boxes to keep their pills safe if they're afraid uh, friends or family may steal them because that does happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I I have a college student who I followed for years. He kept his locked in his trunk because he didn't trust his roommates, so they were always locked in the trunk of his car. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I I think patients can be inventive, but um, I very much worry about um, this is often a frail population. And you never know who family or friend are going through medicine cabinets. So really, we do a lot of education about how to take pain medications and how to keep them safe and their responsibilities. So what are the best interventions that you've seen over your years in terms of keeping those pills safe? I'm very big on lockboxes. For for opiate medications, so that really only one or two people have the key. Um, I've seen people use um, tackle boxes for fishing with the key, but really something where no one randomly can get in. Um, so I think that's important. Um, so that's that's one thing. But probably the number one real thing is education. Letting them know that the, the, these drugs can do harm if they get out of the house. And the last thing you want is your grandkids getting sick or someone because they got a hold of the medications, which could be potentially dangerous to them. And so uh, for the provider who's prescribing them, they want it to be safe, too, because if things go haywire, you know, they're looking at their license if they didn't do the right things. Right. So, Patrick, besides lockboxes, what else would you tell people 
about how to keep their drugs safe? I think the first thing I would do is uh, emphasize to the patient and their their family members or care, caretakers is that uh, why opiates are wonderful medications to relieve pain and other symptoms like shortness of breath, they also can cause potential harm. And the advantage the patient will have is they'll be tolerant. So um, meaning the side effects for them are going to be much less than it would be for someone else. So um, I want the drugs kept in a safe place. I want them to bring their medications in with them on at every visit. And the reason is because we're going to count the pills to make sure you're taking them correctly. And if you're not, it means we need to do more education. Um, and if, you're, if there's too many, it means maybe you don't need as high a dose. If there's not enough in there, it means maybe you're taking them more than we prescribed and maybe we're not prescribing enough. And mm-hmm. so those would be the two things that we'd be looking at. I think we do a thing which is called an agreement, and it basically explains what your responsibilities are, and that's to keep the medications safe. That's to use them as we prescribe. That's to call us if they're not working or if there's a problem with it. My expectation is that if, if things aren't working, the medication is not managing your pain, you should be contacting us. If you're having side effects from the medication, you should be contacting us. Could one of the barriers also be that people are hesitant to call in? So I've had patients who come in, they say, well, this just wasn't working. And so I stopped taking it and I'm looking at my notes. It's like, well, I haven't heard from you about that. that. So I I find, actually, I think my patients are really good at um, emailing um, more than calling. And Mm -hmm. they'll they'll drop drop an email in um, here, it would be my chart, but I'm used to getting emails um, and usually they're open by one of the nurses in clinic. But basically, I want to hear if it's not working because it should be working. I want to hear if you're finding that the the burden the medication is worse than the benefit. So you're having, you're feeling sleepy all the time. You're throwing up. You're constipated. I want to hear about those. I I'm going to randomly do a drug screen on you because I want to make sure the drugs are there, and I want to be able to demonstrate that you're using them appropriately if there's a problem in the future, and those will be pretty randomized. And it, you know. I think the big thing that when we're managing pain medications, I'm also looking at you. I want to see your function get better. And if we're giving you pain medication and you're hurting too much to get out of a chair, you're too sleepy to read the newspaper, your your quality hasn't improved, then these may not be the right medications for you. Mm-hmm. But we we want to make them safe. And that, the first thing is you have to use them appropriately. If there are questions, I don't want you using them unless you understand how to use them. I want them to be safe for you. I want them to be safe for your family. And I want to be safe for the community. And so I don't want those medications showing up where they don't belong. Pain management that I I I think we we've hit all the high points. Are there any questions about this issue that I didn't ask you that you, that you think our listeners need to know about? I, I think that the barriers are going to be very different to every individual because they may have had a family member with a history of addiction. They, they may have watched a loved one take a medication and do poorly on it. They may have known a friend or heard stories. Um, And there's a lot of old wives tales out there about what things can do and can't do. And that's why an open, honest communication with the person who's managing you or your loved one's pain is critical to success. And, you know, I'll spend 15 or 20 minutes making sure everyone understands everything because I want this to work Mm -hmm. and I want it to improve your quality of life. So, Patrick, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about this. And for our listeners, I think what's what's 
good about as you listen to this is to know what usually happens, to know that, you know, you might be asked to sign a contract, do a urine test, bring your meds in. And your clinician, your nurse practitioner, your physician, or your PA is not doing it because they think you're going to misappropriate your drugs or not use them correctly. They're doing it because it's the standard of care. It's how yeah. we keep you safe. And Absolutely. So, it's an agreement between you and who's prescribing. Right. So this is this is normal operating procedure. It's it's a part of it. It's to keep everybody safe and for you to have the best quality of life at the end of life uh, with your pain, pain management. Absolutely. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you to Patrick Coyne for that fascinating interview. Please stay tuned for the continuing saga of Everyone Dies, and thank you for listening. This is Charlie Navarrete. And from rocker Neil Young, better to burn out than fade away. And I'm Marianne Manso, and we'll see you next week. Remember, every day is a gift. This podcast does not provide medical advice. All discussion on this podcast, such as treatments, dosages, outcomes, charts, patient profiles, advice, messages, and any other discussion are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your primary care practitioner or other qualified health providers with any questions that you may have regarding your health. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard from this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Everyone Dies does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, practitioners, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned in this podcast. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast by persons appearing on this podcast at the invitation of Everyone Dies or by other members is solely at your own risk.